this is Lori Forster, the wine coach with The Sipping Point, and I'm so excited because on the other end of the country, I have Sam Spencer from Head High Wines. Right there, you can see him. He looks wonderful, and we're going to talk all about your winery, the wines, but I love to start The Sipping Point, which is the name of my show. It's so much more important than The Tipping Point. Talking about, <laughs> and I've gotten to interview some really amazing people, Robert Parker and Anthony Bourdain and, and now you, but I always want to know how people got into the wine business. I'm a career changer. Software used to be my thing, and, and now uh, I'm in wine. So, Sam, thanks for joining me, and we'd love to hear your story. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be on your show. Um, I've been in the wine industry my whole adult life. Uh, I didn't grow up in it, but I had some, um, some close family friends who welcomed me into their business when I was a young guy in the industry in my early 20s, and I really never looked back. Um, I spent a little time um, before I was in the wine industry working, um, working on Wall Street in a kind of like very junior capacity and did not care for it. Um, I was working on a trading desk, clearing trades, making sure executions happened, and it was just, yeah, it was, it was a particular form of hell that wasn't for me. <laughs> <laughs> that will drive you to drinking, maybe. That drive you to drinking and drive you to look to other opportunities. And so I, you know, my mother's my mother's family are from California. She grew up in Berkeley, um, in the Bay Area, and I have some family in the Napa Valley, and also family friends. And so I came out in '92, shortly after college, and spending some time in New York. Um, and uh, I just landed here, and I thought, well, I spend a little bit of time and kind of understand this business, and then maybe go do something else. Um, and it just has blossomed into, uh, I mean, a tremendous career that I could never really have uh, envisioned entirely because it just keeps unfolding. And uh, I love what I do. I'm really fortunate to do it. Um, you know, from head high and sort of working our way backwards in chronology, I've, I've had different experiences at different brands and different, different types of wine companies um, at, at both small scale and really large scale. And, um, and each of those experiences really kind of formulated the goal and the decisions that I made to, to create Head High with my partner. Um, and uh, we've taken, you know, taken influences from all of our disciplines, farming, et cetera, because I also farm grapes, which is uh, something that is really, uh, you know, I find really critical and important to the process. Of course, it's where vineyards start, but to be able to be in control of that and execute wine at the same time, that's... Uh, it's a really, it's a great privilege. And um, so anyhow, um, that's how I came into the business. And I thought I'd stick around for a little bit. And here I am, a vineyard, you know, deeply immersed and doesn't seem like I'm going anywhere. <laughs> right. And did I uh, understand correctly that at one point you were on the hospitality side in a wine bar? Yeah, I, I right out of, um, right after I, I was here in the Napa, well, I'm in Sonoma today, but I live in the Napa Valley. So I was in the Napa Valley for a couple of vintages and traveling and doing some work abroad. And I came back and one of my mentors, a guy named Jay Hemingway, said, you know what? He owns Green and Red Vineyards, if you're familiar. So that's where I started. It's a very small, well, medium-sized, but small boutique winery, uh, medium to small size boutique winery focused on Zinfandel. And that's where I got my start um, in, the, in those early days. And he said, you know, listen, if you want to do this seriously, you need to get better educated. But more importantly, you really need to, to learn how to sell wine. And so he introduced me to a company, a broker in San Francisco, who were handling his, his, his portfolio as well as Paul Meyer and some other great wineries. And I hit the streets and started slinging wine. Wow. And the truth of the matter was, is, is, is that though I didn't love that job, it was really critical because you, the, you know, the name of the game in this business is after you get to do all the fun part of making wine, then you got to go do the hard part, which is selling it. Right. And, um, and so I spent a year and a half doing that. But while I was selling wine, I met my first two business partners and we opened a, a place called Haze and Vine. Um, and that was in December of 93 or four. Anyhow, one of those years. Yeah. And, um, and it was a, um, it was a really amazing experience for me. I tasted thousands and thousands and thousands of wines and that's not an exaggeration. I took notes on every wine I everyone I tasted in that period of time. And it really formulated an idea and, and I, you know, an idea and uh, in theory I have, I mean, about what I like and what I wanted to taste and what I wanted to make. And I think, you know, for all the education I've had, which I've had in you know, some additional graduate school, you know, Davis and so forth, that was the single most important thing I ever did because I, that, that process of taking notes 
the motor memory, I can conjure just about any one of those wines. And though I don't profess, profess to have a perfect palate or palate memory, just the act of taking notes changed the way I experienced wine. Wow. And I learned about wines from all over the world. And that was, uh, I, I loved it. I'd love to go back and do it again. Actually, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I always think, you know, when I'm educating or doing corporate events, that I want people to learn how to trust their own taste. Mm -hmm. I think that process that you're describing is what, you know, it's not just take a sip, you like it or not, but really, why do you like it? You know, is it the body? Is it the flavors, the aromas, the tannin, the acid? And once you can really describe with the, in those ways, you can get any wine you're going to love if you can just describe to the psalm or your wine store person, you know, with, with the right language. Well, you know, and the thing is, I think so many people are afraid of, of speaking about wine in general because, I mean, I noticed, you know, one of your tags line is about the demystification of wine. When yeah. we opened up Hayes and Vine, that was what we were saying. It's like, we want to demystify wine. We wanted to do it in a beautiful environment. We had a really lovely space and um, a place that made people look great in the midst of winter in San Francisco, which though these days is usually pretty sunny. There were, that was, th those years were pretty wet and people get green around February. You know, they're just, they've been <laughs> indoors too much. And, and, you know, it, but anyhow, what I notice actually from time to time, I'll go back and read my notes. If I'm moving my office or what have you, I'll just you know, thumb through them. I realized that the vernacular and the language that I used evolved so much to the point where over the years and still today, I've got a, a you know, really specific uh, vocabulary that I use that means I know exactly what it means. It may not mean anything right. specifically to you, but it's my, my way of understanding. And, you know, and I, you know, I trust and rely on Psalms all the time because that's their job is to keep their head in the, you know, their antennas out there. And when you're going to dinner and you want something great, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, I can steer in the really good stuff, but to get you know, the really the established categories, but to get something that, you know, you might not know from Sicily and some, you know, super geeky hipster wine, <laughs> that's where you're going to find, that's where you're going to find that stuff. And so I, I, I love, I love still to be exposed to things that I haven't tasted before. It's just, you know, it's thrilling. Yeah. Was there one wine uh, that sticks out in your mind when you were first sort of tasting and getting into wine that really sort of rocked your world and you're like, wow. Now. Yeah, I think, you know, I remember actually having some, um, some Saint-Emilion, um, you know, back in the early 90s that was, I want to say it was 90 or 91, so probably drinking it in ni early, you know, drinking it in 92 or 93. Right. And these, you know, and these, these wines to me, I just didn't really understand the possibility and depth and warmer vintages. I mean, I grew up, as I said, on the East Coast, and we drank a lot of European wine, but most of what I cut my teeth on was like Perenne and, you know, La Vielle Ferme and inexpensive yeah. Italian, you know, it was just what we drank in our house. Yeah. And when I started tasting wines, I was like, oh, wow. And this was before I was even in the industry. I was like, this is really something. And uh, I can't remember the producer, but I can picture the bottle. And, um, you know, and then I started drink, you know, started doing some more exploration, exploration while I was at Hayes and Vine. And I started really getting into Italian wines and I still am to this day. Um, I know they're not for everybody, but I think they're some of the most fabulous wines in the world. And yeah. I love them too. And, you know, and that kind of cascaded into Spanish wines. And all of these places I've had the opportunity to visit and spend time and actually ultimately make wine because I ran a negotiant business on the winemaking side for several years, which was years after. <laughs> you know, I, I have done a lot. You know, I mean, I, I have. And I've been really fortunate. To, I mean, not everything, obviously. There's more to more to learn all the time. But but I, I really have had a, a tremendous breadth and I'm so grateful that I have because the big side of winemaking was something I didn't really know before. And when I went to go work, I worked for um, a, a negotiating business called Cameron Hughes and I was director of wine growing and oversaw everything related to wine, wine making and sourcing globally. Mm -hmm. So I had this opportunity to make wines in Bordeaux and Burgundy and the Rhone and, and a little bit in Italy in the Alta Adige. Um, you know, and we were, we were looking to, to, to shore up our supply in 2009, 10 and 11 when there were grape shortages here. And so, you know, most people, when I took that job said, Oh, why are you doing that? Like, what's the, what, what, why, what, what, that doesn't jive with what your career has been to this point. I was like, exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, and when, when the opportunity to start spending time in Spain and all these places and sourcing wines over there happened, I was like, this is an unbelievable dream. And it really was, it was incredible to be able to put, you know, my feet on the ground and interact with other producers and, and do that. It was one of, yeah, a really, really tremendous gift.
what an education too. I think traveling, uh, my, uh, Aha wine or OMG wine, I guess, if you will, is Barolo. I'm a huge Barolo fan. And that the first time I tried one, I was like blown away about how different it was from so many of the wines I had enjoyed. And so it really, you know, is so varied in its aromas and flavors. So I, I'm also a big Italian. <laughs> in vineyard to vineyard, you know, I mean, just even I did a 2008 retrospective tasting of Barolo not too long ago. Yeah. Um, and it was just Stunning. I had I'd actually tasted most of these wines back in 2011 or 12. Okay. And then to taste them a few years along just to see that evolution was incredible. But yeah, I, I have a big, you know, I love Barola. I would drink a lot more of it if I could afford it. Right. I know. I know. You got to find substitutes. Well, great. So speaking of wine, um, let's talk about, you know, head high wines. And I have two here in front of me that, uh, that we can actually taste and talk about. So, you know, tell me, uh, you have this varied background making wine all over the world and, uh, and all these different capacities. W what is the, was your goal with these wines? Well, when, um, when we launched head high, I, I had left my job with Cameron and I, I knew that I wanted to incorporate both, both of my experience from Cameron's business as well as I owned a brand called Spencer Rollison, which we sold in 08. And to kind of take the small, meticulous winemaking and jewelry making, if you will, and apply it into something that would be bigger and more playful. I wanted to have fun in this industry. This is an industry that should be fun all the time. It isn't all the time because it's a business, unfortunately, but um, at least for me. Yeah. But, uh, but I really wanted to do something that appealed to to my to the broader disciplines of my life, and one of the things that I'm a really ser really serious about is surfing. And my business partner Bill Price is also a lifelong surfer. He grew up in Hawaii. I grew up on the East Coast, but I've been surfing now for 30 years, and I think he's been surfing for 40 or more. Wow. And um, and we we thought sort of just talking about the idea, and, and the focus and emphasis really is on Pinot, but we also make red wine, is red blend a red blend as well. We wanted to be able to source and rely on some of his vineyards as well as my vineyards, and build a business that was going to be you know, appealing and appeal to kind of people like myself. Like I, I feel like, you know, I wanted to, I want to drink delicious wine, delicious wines that are not outrageously expensive. I want to know that they're technically well-made. They've got great fruit and really nice and beautiful packaging. And so mm -hmm. we started playing around with the, uh, with the concept and that's, there you go. That's mm -hmm. our, that's our wine. That's the 2013 oh, Sonoma yeah. Coast Pinot. That's how you can tell how much you've drunk or how high you are. <laughs> I know, that's scary, isn't it? Um, so it's an inverse scale. <laughs> um, but uh, but we, we also wanted to build a brand that had a philanthropic initiative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're privileged to be in this industry and we rely on a lot of, you know, a lot of many people uh, in, the, in these valleys who, who take care of our businesses and their families take care of our businesses. And so we wanted to give back to them as well as do something solid for the environment. So we work um, with two nonprofits currently uh, where we donate 50 cents from every bottle we sell. So we divide that evenly between Sustainable Surf, which uh, is, a, is a new startup uh, nonprofit that really focuses on, on greening up the surf industry. And now actually they're kind of turning their guns into the wine industry and doing, because of our relationship, they, they're doing great things. And they're they're currently really trying to raise money in a big way to, to, to address um, ocean plastics, the you know, pollution in the ocean, which is really turning out to be a massive, massive problem for us. Mm -hmm. And since we like to play in the water, we thought we would support that. And the other people we support is Sonoma Valley Education Foundation. They're a local, um, they're a local philanthropic or local nonprofit who focus largely on um, uh, literacy. And they are really, really good at what they do. They're super, super effective, and they focus largely on the Sonoma Valley. And the families that are mainly affected by that are mostly the families that work in our industry. Mm -hmm. And so to be supportive of that, we thought that was a great thing. So we wanted to have you know, a playful but serious approach and a very meticulous approach to our wine growing, tapping into our vineyard network so that we could give you a delicious bottle of wine that over-delivers every time. Great. So uh, I have the Pinot Noir here. Uh, mm -hmm is the uh, 2013 vintage. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, this Pinot is this famed grape and there's the French Burgundy style and the Oregon. I just did a wine dinner this weekend with uh, a bunch of Oregon Pinots, which is, has their own style. 
how would you describe to a Pinot Noir lover the style uh, of the head high Pinot? Well, one of the things we wanted to focus on is the breadth and depth that the Sonoma Coast has to offer. So we don't rely on any one vineyard. It's not meant to be a single vineyard expression or an estate bottled wine. We wanted to work with vineyard, vineyards on the true Sonoma Coast and all the way into the warmer regions um, uh, you know, to, to the east. And, uh, and, and we do that. So we work with about five different vineyards at different elevations. Um, Sorry, turning that off. No problem. It's funny. As that happened, someone opened my door over here. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, So we work with uh, five different vineyards. Um, my partner, Bill, owns a vineyard called Gaps Crown and another called Durrell. Durrell's a, an older vineyard here just to the west of our offices. Um, and Gaps is a little further north on Sonoma Mountain, both higher elevation cool sites. Yeah. We buy um, fruit from our neighbors, the San Giacomos, from a couple of sites of theirs, one called Bella, another called El Noviero. And then we work with Wildcat Vineyard, um, which is uh, associated, uh, Justin Fagioli developed it with some, some, some other partners. He, Justin was one of, the, one of the founders at Ravenswood. Um, so up above Sears Point, if you're familiar, all, mostly volcanic, really different from the rest of the sites. And then we take uh, some fruit from a couple of other sites here in the west side of Sonoma that are not dramatic, but just really great vineyards, solid producers. Um, and the goal is to scale this up. We're, we're really wanting this to be a national brand. So we wanted to work with people who could do that with us. Nice. Um, it, it's so elegant and it's smooth. That's well, you know, it's got that um, mouthwatering acidity, which is what I love about Pinot. You, you know, you already know you want food with this. You know, right. it's, uh, I would say, meant for food, but it's also got such great elegance to it. What do you think, um, you know, what do you do, I guess, as a winemaker to ensure that that happens? Well, I work, um, I've got a right-hand uh, right guy named Mike Payne, um, who's a really deft winemaker as well. And so between the two of us, we've got, you know, we we have a process of blending and assembling, you know, pieces as we go. So we kind of evaluate right at the end of vintage, the vintage what we think are our highest quality lots and get them together. And then, you know, we'll 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 barrel that down and work with different different new small amounts of new oak but we what we're really trying to do is just find that like the best fruit dimension and you know highlight that and, and, and really really get get something that's true and fresh and like you said that mouthwatering acidity like I I, I don't want to drink ponderous wines I don't want to drink right. super high alcohol wines I'm not opposed to like to you know if it's appropriate and they're balanced but I mean but with Pinot for me I want to drink Pinot that tastes like Pinot Noir Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not really interested in tasting or drinking Pinot that tastes like Zinfandel or like, you know, high alcohol Syrah. Right. And um, so we're trying to make picking decisions that take in, that into account, freshness, red fruit, et cetera, being really deft with the oak and using just a small amount of it. And, um, and then doing, you know, comprehensive blending. So we really know what we have and getting things down to barrel as early as possible. We also leave things on the lees. So in the solids and the barrels to kind of build mouthfeel, which also I think builds tension, especially when you have that fresh, you know, that fresh acidity. Right. And, um, when you say the blending, so just for people listening or watching with all those different sites and even lots within those sites that you're uh, mm -hmm. getting your Pinot from, you're making individual wines from those different vineyards and then deciding how to put them exactly. together. Exactly. So we, we, we do it in an iter iterative, it, it, to, iter I can't speak, iterative uh, fashion. We need more wine. <laughs> we need more wine, obviously. I know it's, 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 it's early in the day for me, but apparently I should open a bottle. <laughs> um, so we, we, we know certain things fit together and as we've evolved, we have new vineyard pieces as well. So from 13, 14 to 15. And so there's certain pieces that just fit together naturally. We know that. Mm -hmm. And from our experience with those vineyards and we'll get those together and create like a, what, what I consider to be like a master blend. Okay. And then we'll evaluate pieces that may be new to us and figure out over time how they fit. And we may not actually make, we may, we may sell some of the wines that we've made if we don't feel they're up to snuff or they're not working for us. We also want to separate our press wines and evaluate those press wines before we incorporate them back because it's a way to, you know, really kind of control tan or tannin management if you're, you know, if you're obviously familiar right. with the firm, but, you know, control the texture of the wine. Because, you know, one thing you can have, you can have really great Pinot and, and, and tremend with tremendous texture that can be just ruined by a little too much tannin. So there's, it's about just finding that balance. And so in our case, it's 
you know, we're evaluating the wines on a monthly basis from that point that we've made the, the master blends and it, we may say, okay, we like what's going on here. That's going to go. That's, that's, that's evolving into, into this point. Okay. This is working for us. We'll put that out there. Um, you know, and typically our blends are mostly done. I would say 85% done by, by February of the year. And then we bottle in July or August. So it gives us a little bit of time just to see how Oak's evolving. Um, but I don't, again, it's like, oh, for me, Oak is, it's really ba- about background and structure and creating a framework to highlight the fruit. Because the vin- you know, to me, the vineyard is really 100% of what we're talking about. Right. And are you, you're not using, I know you're only, I think I said a quarter new Oak. So mostly yeah. used. So you're not trying to impart a lot of that. No, I want it to be super subtle. I mean, what I want to talk about is the fruit in the wine rather than the barrels. Yes. Um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, so over the years, I've got a kind of a selection of Coopers. I know and I, I know what to anticipate. So we're not looking at, say, 10 different Coopers. We work with three or four mm-hmm. and who might have a track record with and produce great barrels and know that the deal is about our wines, not about their barrels, although sometimes they get confused. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's delicious. You have all that great red fruit, uh, mouth-watering acidity, and um, nice medium, um, 14.2%. I mean, that's really, a, you know, it's a nice food-friendly um, yeah. alcohol sweet. We just, yeah, we don't want to, yeah, we don't, I mean, like I said, I, I don't want, I want, Again, I want you to enjoy, I want, you know, the biggest compliment you can tell me is the wine's delicious. And that's, that's, that truly is what I want to hear. Right. And when people tell me, hey, I had this with X, Y, and Z with dinner, I, and, and it was fantastic, you know, I, I, that's just music to my ears. And what I, you know, I want people to have that experience. I want them to take the wine out. I also want people to drink these wines. I, they're priced in a way that make it accessible to crack these on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm not expecting to be your Saturday night splurge. But, um, but I, but I definitely would love to be your, all your in between t- at the table, all the time in between. Right. Now, I think I saw on your website, um, on the website, it's retailing around 35. Is that pretty? Yes, thin? that's, that's a, You can find it for a little let here. You know, I mean, there's variation around the country, just depending yeah. on how the state, you know, the different distributors price them. But, but that's typically what you'll see it on the shelves. I've seen it as low as 29.99 in a few places, but that's, we're, you know, typically in that $30 range. And do you see, you know, I know you were talking about building the brand into more of, you know, scaling up, Mm -hmm. making more, um, being able to serve a national audience. How will that translate with the price? I'm curious. Actually, our prices are going to go down just a little bit. Okay. So rather than taking them up, because, because we realized that, you know, at that price, that's, it's not, that's not an, for, for, it's not an everyday wine for everyone. And what we wanted to do was to, to be able to, you know, to, to reach a broader audience. So the, most of our wine we sell on premise. So we sell to restaurants and we, we really, really aggressively go after glass pours. We want people to experience the wine in that environment and then come home and either buy directly from us or buy from our, our retailers. So we work largely with independent retailers. But some of the feedback we got when we said this is what our goal, these are our goals, where we need some help on price. And so with the 14 and in, in, in 15 vintages, we have kept things flat, but where you can really, where you can see and where you can experience the wines at, for a great deal, you know, really good deals on, on premise by the glass. And that's how we're trying to build that following. Gotcha. Um, so. Yeah. And if you go to um, headhighwines.com um, is where you can order that to have it delivered to your home. Uh, I'm assuming Provided I- you're in a compliant state. Yeah. Yeah. How about Maryland? Are you going to be able to send it to me in Maryland? Um, I, I I, you know, I forget, I, I forget, I'm not on top of my direct to consumer state by state, but I think Maryland is okay. You, I think you have to have a license though, right? As you, well, as a consumer. Well, we now are allowed um, to get direct shipments from wineries as a consumer. I actually have a Parker permit, the Robert Parker permit, because mm-hmm. of the uh, business of writing about wines. I can, right. I've been able to receive shipments, but now anyone can receive as long as you are, permitted to ship within Maryland. Yeah. It can be direct from the winery. It can't be from a wine store or a wine club. It has to be direct. Yeah. So in that case, I know that we have, we, we are, you know, I know that our, our, we have those licenses. So yes, we can ship Perfect. to Maryland. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, 
we were talking about bringing it more to a national audience. And one thing I was asked at my wine dinner over the weekend, and I just, I want to get your take on this question, but people are forever asking me, what's a great $10 Pinot? <laughs> and my perspective on that, you know, my answer to them was, you know, if you have $10, if you're truly looking to buy a $10 wine, I wouldn't choose Pinot. Because I wouldn't I either. Like, yeah, it's a grape you want to spend a little bit more money on because it takes more to make a fabulous Pinot. I think, I think for the most part, you get rewarded for what you the way you spend on Pinot, whether it's Burgundy or in domestically in, in Sonoma, you know, in the greater Sonoma region and then into Oregon. I mean, pricing in Oregon is a little higher than, you know, they have a, they, there's a threshold there that we haven't totally crossed. Like, I mean, the whole industry is priced a little bit higher and the better wines certainly sell for more. I mean, I think that I think that Pinot really follows a very um, sort of distinct AOC domestically, even though, of course, we don't have an Appalachian, you know, Contrôle situation. Mm -hmm. But um, but you know, the quality of the dirt really is reflected in, in the price of the grapes and thus in the mm -hmm. cost of the wine. And so, um, you know, depending on who you're working with, I think if you're going to spend fifty dollars on a bottle of Pinot, you're really going to be happy. Right. You know, and whether it's here, Burgundy, or in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and given $50 is just scraping the sort of bottom of the classified, you know, classified growths in Burgundy, but you can still find great wines. And, um, you know, as far as 10 bucks go, you know, where, where I would spend my money, Spain, you know, I mean, I made a lot of $10 gar Garnacha for my old company. Wow. And, um, and I loved, I just loved the, you know, the, the legacy and historic elements of, of those regions. I, I made some wine, I mean, wines for several years in Campo de Borgia. And those wines are just tremendous. I mean, so even to buy the Hoven examples that have seen no oak, yeah. they're just juicy and tasty and easily accessible. And those are, I think that's what people want for 10 bucks. Absolutely. Last year, my New Year's resolution was drink more Spanish wine. So it was an easy one to keep. It was. <laughs> All right. Well, so the Pinot, delicious. And uh, Sonoma, of course, it is a grape that's synonymous with that area. But next to that, um, I have your red blend. And uh, just for folks, uh, I'm going to hold them both up because you have the Pinot in the Burgundy bottle and then the red blend in the Bordeaux high shoulder bottle. Um, people are always sort of interested in that idea, you know, because right. you'll be able to tell by the shape of the bottle a little bit about uh, what's in it or the style. So tell me with the Bordeaux bottle, we have this wonderful blend here. Uh, what was your inspiration? There? Well, you know, it's just funny. We talked about Spanish wine and I didn't tee this up necessarily, but because of my time I spent in, in the southwest of, south, southwest of France, as well as in the Catalan region in Spain, when I set about to make this wine, I had some ideas in my head about what might work. And um, the Malbec vineyard that this, this, so the blend is Malbec, Merlot, Cabernet. So it's like, is it th 36 Malbec, 20 Cabernet, 20 Merlot. Mm -hmm. And then the balance is Grenache and Zinfandel. Right. If I had more Grenache, it would have been 100% Grenache. You know, not 100% not Grenache, but more, you know, it would have been, you know, whatever that is, 20% Grenache. Right. But in my mind's eye, I was really thinking about Catalan wines. And, um, and just, I had, I didn't have to follow an orthodoxy here. I could do what I wanted. I did, you know, this was a new business that just didn't really have uh, any constraints. And so I knew the blocks of, and some of the fruits coming from my vineyard, some of it's coming from a vineyard I've worked with for many years. And, um, I, uh, I just felt like we could do something that was delicious, really, you know, easily approachable, but satisfying in a lot of different factions, you know, with spice and, you know, dimension to it. And, um, and I really like it. I'm not a big fan of Malbec all on its own, but it's an amazing blender. And, um, you know, and, and in my, you know, of course, Zinfandel mainly exists here, but I feel like it has a close cousin of Grenache if you, if you handle it correctly. Right. Yeah. It's such a great, um, like full of fruit, but a little, enough of that tannin to be interesting, I think with me and things like that, but not so like strip your mouth, uh, you know, a lot of the really monsters, I, I have a hard time drinking with food because they're just, you know, so the oak is so overpowering. Well, and again, I wanted to be really deft with the oak that we use so that oak was the last thing you were talking about as opposed right. to the first thing. And then also in terms of the way we, you know, the vineyards, my vineyards, the Lake County piece, because the, the blend is actually Sonoma and Napa Lake. The Lake County and Napa pieces are, are under my umbrella. 
and then the Sonoma piece, some of it's coming from Bill's properties and then some from neighbors again. Um, and, uh, you know, the goal was to kind of highlight the region and, uh, make something that was really tasty and, and, you know, and interesting and, and sort of intellectually engaging. Cause I think if you look at that, you know, most people who are accustomed to drinking Malbec drink it either in very small percentages in Cabernet or in vast percentages in, uh, you know, in Argentine wine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I also, I mean, I also got the opportunity to make wine in Argentina and kind of see, you know, get into the, to the heart of that mindset. And, um, and it informed me a lot about Malbec. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, but, but for me, I wanted to do something that had a little more, more, had more facets to it, a little more interesting style and a little more attenuated on the palate and that kind of thing. And I find that, um, it's, it's funny cause consumers are really enamored with the whole red blend category. Uh, it's one of the you know, growth categories out there along with rosé, which I see you do make a rosé. We do. Uh, it probably it gets sold out very quickly. Um, but red blend consumers in America, you know, are sort of, you know, really discovering the red blend, even though they've been having them for years, but we call them Bordeaux or we call them Rhone. Or Claret or, you know, or, 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 or Meritage or something to that effect. Right. I think, um, you know, I think that, you know, there, there are a couple pioneers in that regard who opened the doors mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and, and, and there are also a lot of unsung pioneers who've been doing it for years who, who you know, sort of limped their businesses along on these things. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they have this overnight success after 15 or 20 years. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think that I think the American American consumers really open to, you know, open to red wines of differing, differing blends. They don't I mean, I think they I think the American consumer wants Cabernet on some level in, in, in those blends. They're like, I need just a little just for reassurance. Um, <laughs> I know that great. <laughs> I, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, but what's, you know, what's interesting is, is that you see blends, I see blends now that are, you know, really idiosyncratic. They're, you know, Cabernet and Carignan and, you know, Zinfandel and Petit Syrah or whatever. And, you know, and provided they're delicious, you know, that, that's, that's the threshold. And I think that, um, you know, I think that the American consumer has become really well-educated over it. One thing that's for sure is over the last 20 years, since I really started in this business, what people know now versus what they knew then is vastly different. And they're informed by shows like yours and the internet and Wine Searcher and, you know, all of these, you know, delectable, you name it. And right. there's like an ongoing conversation. And especially with people who I notice, you know, I, my, my assistant's in his early 30s, like he relies on such a different network to get his information. He doesn't, I mean, he is aware of Parker, but you know, knows who he is, of course, but, but doesn't read him like I do. I mean, I get it. And then I thumb through it. I'm like, okay, how did all my friends do what's going yeah. on in Italy? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so it's just, it's a changing world. And I think it's a, I think it's exciting. I think the wine industry has never been better positioned than it is today. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are obviously some threats and things like that, but the fact of the matter is that there's just a vast world of wine out there and you can find what you want and continue, you know, pursue that and you don't have to break the bank to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of a double edged, you know, I, um, I incorporate humor a lot when I'm doing events and education because, you know, some people can come to wine and it, feeling like, oh, it's going to be really snooty and intimidating. And I always out myself right away and let them know that the first wine I ever tried was Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill. <laughs> if you remember the stuff and, I do. you know, to my credit, because a lot of wine snobs are like, oh boy, you know, back when I first tried wine, there wasn't a lot of options out there. There was a cheap, sweet stuff. And then maybe you know, if you had the money, a Bordeaux or Burgundy, but now thanks to Kermit Lynch and all these other amazing people, you know, we have so many choices. So on one hand, it's this fabulous thing that mm -hmm. we can get wine from anywhere around the world in a wine store, uh, say in New York city or right. DC. Um, but we, we also have to know more to, you know, to kind of figure out what is this, you know, wine from Bulgaria that's on the shelf or, or what have you. Uh, well, Europe, and there is a proliferation of great importers and they're coming out all the time. I mean, I, you yeah. know, I mean, Kermit's a true hero of mine. I mean, I don't, I've met him I've, over the years. I don't know him, but, but, you know, I, I bought a lot of wine from his shop. And actually when I was at Hazenbein, we bought 
you know, huge amounts of wine from him. I mean, Bruce Nyers, who's also a wine grower here in, in, across oh, I love, the Napa I love Valley. Myers. Yeah. Yeah, he's lovely and and interesting and very, you know, I mean, he he worked for Kermit for years and years. But right. I mean, we're we're blessed in the Bay Area with so much good wine. There's more than you could ever ever drink, you know. Um, but I mean, but in general, we're. I mean, you're right. It's a double-edged sword. There's so much choice. And you can easily become paralyzed trying to figure out what you like. But the fact of the matter is, is the other thing is, is because of that, I think this is the, you know, why there's the, you know, the, ri the rise of the sommelier in terms of, you know, I mean, I think 20 years ago, being, I mean, there were only a few master sommeliers in the country. I mean, Larry Stone, who is an old friend of mine, was the first, I believe. And, you know, at the time when I met him, I think there were five or six. And now there are five or six minted every month. Right. But, I mean, that's an, that's an interesting phenomenon. You know, that, you know, the cult of personality around that. I haven't seen the new Psalm Into the Bottle movie, but I like the first movie, Psalm, a lot. I saw the first. I have not seen, like you, the second, but uh, it's, on my, it's on my list. <laughs> but, I mean, the arbiter, so the arbiters of information are the people who are controlling, you know, the gatekeepers at certain levels. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's, you know, and I think that the, what's happening is they're sort of categorically becoming different. You know, Somalis who do this, Somalis who, you know, focus on abstract and obscure spots, some people who are in the mainstream and know everything about Napa Valley and Bordeaux and Burgundy, mm -hmm. and then people are out on the peripheries doing different things, and, you know, with restaurants that are, you know, following along, and I think it's great. I mean, I just, I have to say, like, dining in the United States right now is some of the, it's, it, I mean, certainly better than it's ever been in my life. Quality of food, quality of wine, selection, all of that. I know, and, you know, the thing is, uh, too, I just did a, a corporate wine executive wine 101 last week for some salespeople about entertaining clients which is kind of how i got into wine mm -hmm. um, and what you can do on your phone you know i have an app for the wine coach and people are probably listening to this interview within my app uh right now mm -hmm. uh, but you know i have wine spectator i have wine advocate on my phone i can check the vintage i can look up the wine i mean you sit down at a dinner table if you are keep it to ask for help you have a lot at your fingertips with just your phone uh a lot more information than we ever did even even the markup i mean there are apps where i can look at the different markup between restaurants in the same city i mean what app is that uh tipsy tipsy yeah. okay tipsy. interesting <laughs> so you know i find that empowering because you know back in the late 90s when i was entertaining clients i didn't have any of that of yeah it. You know? Are you a stand-up comedian? Is that where you were saying? Is that is that? I, I do uh, as a bucket list thing. About five years ago, I took uh, stand-up comedy class at the DC Improv, mm -hmm. and so I do have some events where I incorporate. You know, when you write comedy, usually the best is your life. So I have lots of jokes about being in the wine business and the things that I think are kind of silly and crazy, and how people get out of hand with the tasting notes and. <laughs> Um, I'm married to a chef, so I have lots of jokes there too. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. That's really cool. I have to say that's something I'm interested in too, that I've never pursued. But um, but it, it's tremendously brave. I got I have to think that sta doing stand up would be one of the biggest sort of hurdles emotionally that you to get up and just be so vulnerable to be funny. I mean, it's it kind of hard to deliver. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You said earlier in the interview about you know, uh, when we talked, maybe even as we were setting up about doing different things, mm -hmm. you wanting to do them because you'd never done them before. Um, and I have this rule every year I have to do one thing that just scares the bejesus out of me. <laughs> but, you know, usually it's, it's very, uh, it, it's a growth opportunity. You know, a couple years ago I did this dancing for the dogs, which is a local fundraiser, like dancing mm -hmm. for the stars. Now, I don't think I'm much better of a dancer now, but <laughs> I just wanted to give it a try and kind of stretch, you know, and that's where the comedy I mm -hmm. always wanted to do. But when you're up there, you definitely feel very naked. And mm -hmm. it's like you're in eighth grade again, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can only imagine. But, you know, it's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, you've obviously seen the Jerry Seinfeld thing, comedians and cars having coffee. I think there's an opportunity to do something with wine that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I do a little show called something to whine about where I do some stand up, we taste some wines, we play some games. Um, so yeah, you'll have to, uh, I'll have to have you join me one time. That would be great. I'd love to. So the red blend is $30. Uh, so we had yeah. 35 for the Pinot and 30 for the red blend. These are both delicious available, of course, 
um, on premise. If you're lucky enough to be at a restaurant that's already serving this or at headhighwines.com, the term head high, that's tied into your surfing background. It's a wave, it's a wave height thing. Um, so when, you're, when you're describing wave height, the easiest way to describe it is to say, you know, from the bottom of the wave, the trough to the top, is it waist high, head, shoulder high, head high, double overhead, triple overhead. Yeah. And so it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's common, you know, common among surfers and other people get it too. But it's kind of cool during, um, during pride last year uh, in the Castro, uh, one of the, one of the retailers we do business with got it. They were equating this with the merit equality stuff. And there was, you know, sort of held your head high. I, I could never have anticipated it. I was so, I was really touched. I was like, That's just great. cool that this ambiguous, you know, that this thing, it had really nothing to do with that got adopted. And they sold a tremendous amount of wine during, during you know, during June last year, as a result, it was Castro Wine Shop. It was really cool. Very cool. Very cool. Well, these are both delicious and you are super fun. I think we can probably just spend hours. <laughs> I don't know if anyone would want to watch that. (laughs) Many different things, but um, if folks want to connect with you, I know we have the website and I've given that out, but are you out there? How are you on social media? Can we connect? We we have a decent presence on social media. I mean, I have to say there's a lot of other, there are a lot of things we do and social media is in the priorities, but it's not the tip top. Um, Mike mainly does that because he's in his early thirties and uh, we put pieces out, you know, we're on Instagram and we're on Facebook. Um, and Twitter a little bit. Um, I, you know, to be honest, I find it that part of it to be, it's, it's, it's hard, like really to have a a strong, strong presence. It takes a lot of work. It's not something you can just throw against the wall and hope to get, get, get good at it. So we write about surfing. We write about wine. We write about things that are interesting to us. If I'm in doing something or catch something in the media that I think is interesting, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll post it or have Mike post it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're definitely there. Head high wines. And, you know, hashtag head high wines, hashtag be committed. That's our official tagline. Our unofficial tagline is we don't care how you get high, just get high with us. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's very West Coast. I love well, it. we are in California after all. Perfect. Well, Sam Spencer from Head High Wines, thank you so much. These are delicious. I look forward to sipping a little bit more after we get done here. And uh, thank you for sharing uh, everything about the winery. And I hope folks will check you out at headhighwines.com and uh, look forward to having you on the show again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Cheers. Cheers.